We'll recognize Senator Duckworth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just ran down from that vote. It's so good to see everybody here today. Um, I just want to first start off by um, uh, openly acknowledging the nominees sitting before us, uh, Mr. Kendall, Ms. Shi, and Ms. Bloom. Congratulations. Um, you would all bring significant experience and expertise to these important roles, and I appreciate each and your willingness to continuing to serve. Ms. Shu, if confirmed, you'll be the highest ranking Asian American Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander civilian in the Department of Defense. I have fought for better representation for the community in this administration, so I was so pleased to see your nomination. If confirmed, I'm sure that you'll make significant contributions to the Department of Defense. I believe truly that our military is stronger when it draws on the full richness of our population for talent, ideas, and leadership. Mr. Kendall, it is so good to see you again and so good to see you nominated for this role. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, I have read your reports and my class work um, on acquisition reform, and I'm just so, so pleased that you have been nominated to lead our Air Force. The Air Force does fulfill a critical slate of missions for the Joint Force and the nation. This is especially true with the Air Force Reserve and the Air National Guard, where wings that fly the C-130, the workhorse of the Air Force, handle both missions overseas and critical domestic missions, such as airlift support, air medical missions, weather reconnaissance, firefighting support for the U.S. Forest Service, and natural disaster relief. The C-130 fleet also sustains the training and operational readiness of the Army National Guard units, as well as the airborne units of the active Army. The reserve components have seen unprecedented activity in the last few years, and our air wings are no exception. The Air National Guard C-130 fleet has provided 68% of hurricane support and 42% of civil unrest support since FY18. These domestic operations are only projected to grow in coming years. In short, our nation relies on our reserve component C-130 fleet, composed of hardworking units like the 182nd Air Wing in Peoria. You know I was going to throw Illinois in here somewhere, right? Yet the Air Force still plans on divesting multiple C-130 squadrons from the reserve components in the next few years. While I understand that the Air Force has difficult decisions to make in how it manages its budget, I've heard from my tech about how concerned he is that the Illinois Air National Guard will not be able to fulfill its duties to Illinois and to the country if there are further C-130 divestments without replacement platforms. I know other members of this committee have heard the same from their governors and their tags. If confirmed, Mr. Kendall, will you commit to working with the governors and the tags of states with reserve and National Guard C-130 wings to ensure that they are able to fulfill their their domestic missions and that the Air Force's di divestment plans do not eliminate the C-130 capacity that our nation has come to rely on without at least replacing it with some other flying platform. Senator, I'm, I'm very aware of the versatility and the utility and the very wide range of missions that C-130 can perform. It's a remarkable platform. It's served us well for a very long time. Um, I, I absolutely can commit to taking all those things into consideration and any trade-offs we have to make in terms of what fleet we can sustain. And I would uh, agree certainly to work with the CAGs and with the states on that there, to make sure their needs are met. Thank you. Um, I'm also concerned about our air mobility capacity. Uh, in fact, I sat down with the Air Force's A-8 last month to receive a classified update on the plans for that C-130 fleet. And in the course of the brief, we discussed the fact that the Air Force had not created a plan for the future air, of air mobility beyond the C-130. While the C-130 continues to play a critical role in our military and will for years, technological advances mean that we need to be thinking about the long-term future of air mobility. This is especially true when it comes to providing air mobility in a contested logistic environment in the Indo-Pacific region, where we need to be prepared to face long distances and advanced adversary targeting and sensing capabilities. If confirmed, Mr. Kendall, will you commit to rapidly delivering a plan for the modernization of the Air Force's air mobility platforms that factors in both overseas and domestic missions? Um, in general, yes, Senator. I'm not sure what activities are underway. That should be something that's going to be reviewed as we build the FY23 budget, and hopefully we'll be able to provide a plan in conjunction with that. But if confirmed, that's one of the things I would look at, the uh, overall mobility posture and how the Air Force, the Department of the Air Force supports that. Thank you. 
Uh, it's clear to me that without this important enabler, we don't have a combat credible deterrent in the Indo-Pacific. And I hope that you share my concern and sense of urgency when it comes to making sure that we are going to be effective in the Indo-Pacific region. I absolutely do. Thank you. Again, it's so good to see you there. And I look forward to working with you. And since, since we last spoke, I now am chair of the Air Land Subcommittee. So, yay, we get to work together a lot more. I look forward to that uh, as well, Senator. And I, did you get your PhD? I'm, I'm curious. I have put it in a different topic. I actually got it on the use of electronic medical records, but I am still working on that on on, on the acquisition reform. And we should talk about future vertical lift as a model and how we operationalize the lessons learned from future vertical lift for other um, uh, DoD acquisition programs. It's a great topic. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I you out of time, Mr. Chairman. You've been very generous.